Good morning, folks. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hang, hang on one second. All right. So we're going to keep adding a couple new of the uh, nucleophilic addition reactions. Um, and we're the, the most the most interesting of these sections. Most of these are pretty straightforward. The sulfur and the hydrogen nucleophiles are going to look a lot like our other nucleophilic addition reactions. Um, you know, sulfur is is really very similar chemically to oxygen. So it's going to behave a lot like our oxygen nucleophiles did. And hydrogen nucleophiles, hydrogen can only get so complicated, right? Because it can only have two electrons. So if you have a hydrogen nucleophile, um, it's really always pretty much going to be the same reaction. A hydrogen nucleophile has to be a hydride. It's the only way you can have a hydrogen nucleophile. So that's going to look a lot like our other um, hydride reactions, lithium lithium aluminum hydride or um i'm blanking on what the other one was uh sodium borohydride um and then the carbon nucleophiles and there's a couple different ways we can have carbon nucle nucleophiles get a little bit more interesting um but we'll start with uh with uh questions from the quiz um for instance why the heck are we bothering with ab initio calculations? I, you phrased it more, more kindly than that. Um, but basically, why the heck does anybody care about ab initio calculations? Um, and the, the answer is that it is it does get used occasionally in industrial research, but it's mostly in academic research at this point. Um, computers aren't to the point where they're they're quite strong enough to fully model everything using these ab initio calculations. Um, so you see a lot in research, and you do see it in industry in some cases because it is really nice if you need to show the electronic properties of a molecule. Um, you can do that with with ab initio calculations. You act, because we're actually calculating the energy of the various orbitals when we're doing this, we can actually predict things like the homo-lumo gap and what wavelength of light these compounds should absorb, um, which winds up being pretty helpful for things like um, developing new uh, organic LEDs uh, or, or solar panels. Um, so anytime you need to know about the electronic properties of, of small molecules, ab initio calculations can be helpful because a lot of times it's, it's faster and cheaper to test some of these things than to make them in an industrial lab and try and characterize them yourself. Um, so it's basically used to sort of as a filter to sort of weed out lots of things that seem like they should be promising but aren't. Um, why is benzene a carcinogen? So carcinogens are tricky, right? Because there's a million and one different ways you can cause cancer. Um, and most of them have separate mechanisms. So I'm, I don't know, and I, don't, I remember looking this up. I think somebody looked, asked me this last year. Um, I, don't, I don't know that the mechanism is actually well understood. Uh, all we know is that if your lungs are exposed to benzene vapors or your skin is exposed to benzene, you have a higher risk of developing um, cancer in those areas, but they don't know exactly why. So something along the lines of it's either it's either going to cause mutations in the genetic code or cause errors in the transcription of, of the genetic code. Um, and we do see this with small molecules in general. They have a tendency to, they can get stuck, especially really small organic molecules can get stuck in between the base pairs in your DNA. Um, because you have your base pairs are a bunch of pi electrons, right? It's a bunch of aromatic molecules that are all stacked on top of each other. Um, and remember, aromatic molecules have favorable interactions when you stack those pi clouds on top of each other. 
Um, so benzene, it could be something like that. Benzene gets in the way of the transcription because it kind of hides out in between the base pairs. Um, there's, there's just, it turns out uh, living cells are really, really complicated. Um, and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, so that, but there's, uh, there's always room for more research in those areas, right? You could be the one that figures out why benzene is a carcinogen when benzaldehyde is not. <clears throat> um, somebody asked why it's uncommon to see two aldehydes on the same molecule. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and two aldehydes on the same molecule winds up being unusual, mostly because aldehydes are so reactive. If you have two aldehydes on the same molecule, odds are they can they will react with each other in some form. Um, so especially if, you know, as long as you've got at least at least four carbons in a row, those aldehydes, the oxygen on one aldehyde could reach the carbonyl from the other aldehyde and wind up with some sort of, of ether formation or cyclo um, ring formation reaction happening, uh, or just converting one of those aldehydes to a carboxylic acid, which is more stable. Um, so it's if you're going to have two aldehydes on the same molecule, odds are one of them is going to react. Um, so it's, it's a pretty uncommon state. Um, we will answer the last one in a second. Um, so another question about, about neurotransmitters and receptor sites. Um, this is a really interesting one because it seems like we're, we're so used to thinking from our, our human-centric point of view that if there are cannabinoid receptors in other, in other animals, why the heck would that be the case? Do they, if you, does that mean if you give weed to sea urchins, you can get them high? Probably not. Um, it probably is that, that a lot of these signal molecules and hormones and neurotransmitters um, get used for multiple processes, both in our bodies and they get used in to for totally different purposes in other animals. Um, so, it's the fact that those receptor sites exist is not um, all of that surprising because we, we're starting from the same playing field as far as we have the same amino acids in all of our proteins, which means we have the same molecules that get used as chemical receptors and chemical messengers um, a lot. But the thing is that our chemical messengers, our neurotransmitters have, have been evolved to kind of control and how our neurons interact, but it could be used for an entirely different purpose in other animals. Just because the same molecules are present doesn't mean they're used for the same purposes. Um, and it, it, you can track how animals have evolved and where they diverge from each other by, by um, receptor sites sometimes. Although because they get used for such different purposes, it's usually um, more effective to track the number of mutations in certain genes that are present in lots of different animals, because we can actually estimate and work backwards and say, okay, um, a mutation happens in this gene on average every 10 years. And this gene is different by 25 base pairs. Therefore, these two animals diverged this many years ago. Um, so it, it usually works better from a statistics point of view to track the um, evolutionary path of organisms and how far, how long ago they diverged by looking at, uh, at the genetic code rather than the actual uh, receptor sites and proteins. And then last but not least, the most relevant question to today, how do we tell whether something is a react, whether a reactant is a nucleophile or an electrophile? Well, remember that what these terms really mean, what it really comes down to is a nucleophile is attracted to a positive charge. So that means that nucleophiles on average are going to either have a negative charge or a partial negative charge. And electrophiles are the exact opposite. Electrophiles are things that have a positive charge um, or at least a partial positive charge. So electrophiles are atoms or or elements sorry atoms or molecules um 
that are electron deficient, that are missing electrons. So anything you can look at it and say it's got a positive charge or it's got extra electrons or extra, um, it's missing electrons is going to be an electrophile. You can look at it and say it has extra electrons, for instance, um, sodium borohydride. Borohydride is BH4 with a negative charge. Well, the fact that it's a negative charge tells us it's going to be a nucleophile. It has too many electrons. So it's in some way or another, it's going to act as a nucleophile. And the same true if you, anything you have that has a positive charge is going to be an electrophile. Right? And in most of these, these organic reactions, um, electrophiles are, are less common for the most part. Um, most organic molecules have a, a lot of electrons. And so it's more common to have nucleophiles attack them. Um, but as we saw with the electrophilic substitution, that's not always the case. All right. So we'll continue adding new nucleophiles in. Well, not necessarily new nucleophiles, but new in the sense that um, that uh, we're reacting them with these class two carbonyls. So the, we, these are the reactions that we finished the other the other day in lab. Does anybody have any questions about these ones that we went over on Tuesday? I remember with the ring ring formation reactions. Be careful to make sure you're counting your atoms properly. Other than that, they don't look any different than the other reactions we've seen. Adam. Actually, I did have a question about like sterics. Does um, I don't know if we ever went over this. Does does uh, the length of the chain ever get involved with you know slowing down the that reaction, a type of reaction? Yeah, we we typically see ring formation reactions happen when we can make a a ring that's either five or six atoms. Um, if it gets much longer than that, then you can see a ring formation reaction happen, but it's not very common. Um, just because there's, you wind up with the pieces being too far apart from each other physically um, and getting all the pieces to twist around just the right way is a little bit trickier. Um, and plus those, those don't wind up having the same general shapes. There's usually, if it, if you could make a cyclooctane, um, a lot of times there's a, it'll wind up rearranging anyway. Turns out six member, six sided and five sided rings are much more stable. Um, so that's typically what you want to be looking for. Um, seven sided, you know, if if there's uh, nothing else happening in the reaction, that can happen, but it's less common. Um, and if you do have big bulky groups around your reactive sites, that can actually affect things as well. So if these two methyl groups were closer to the nitrogen, it, you'd be less likely to form that reaction just because there's just physically more stuff in the way. All right, so we, we talked about two nitrogen functional groups in particular. Um, we were looking at ah, keyboard shortcuts. Um, we were talking about if you have a primary amine reacting with an aldehyde, you can wind up with the imine. And if you have the, oops, that's what I meant to do. Uh, if you had a secondary amine, you wind up with the enamine. Right, so a secondary amine could look like, 
there's our enamine structure. And so turns out, depending on the exact conditions, there are actually a couple other nitrogen-based functional groups we can form um, that wind up being, being significant in one way or another. Um, one of them is called an oxime. And it really, the process of these doesn't look any different than, than the imine formation. An oxime is a nitrogen that's attached to an oxygen, as opposed to a nitrogen that's attached, attached to a carbon. We wind up making a functional group that looks very, very similar though, right? Just instead of having an R group over here, we have an OH. Um, and if you happen to have two nitrogens attached to each other, we see the same thing, except with the nitrogen attached, and that's called a hydrozone. Sounds like a water park. Um, so these kind of go in our category of, well, if you have a nitrogen around, you can make these things, but really it's not any different than the reaction we already saw. You're going to wind up with the nitrogen attacking the oxygen, oxygen making room, you protonate the oxygen, then the oxygen leaves as water, um, and you make the carbon nitrogen pi bond. In both cases, it's the same exact steps. You're going to make go through a step that are an intermediate that looks like this. And then you're going to wind up kicking that oxygen off and the nitrogen lone pair can come down here and make a pi bond. Right, so it's same reaction that we spent Tuesday going over. Um, it's just because having an oxygen attached to the nitrogen makes it a different functional group than having a carbon attached. So we get we call these different reactions, even though really it's the same thing. Um, hydrozones wind up being really important, though, because they actually show up a lot in synthesis. Um, because you can turn a hydrozone into um, a saturated carbon. Basically, you can replace both of the carbon nitrogen bonds in a hydrozone with hydrogens. Um, so this is this is one of the few ways we had have to actually take. Um, an oxygen and fully reduce it to carbon hydrogen bonds. Because if we just tried, if we just started from the ketone and tried to reduce it with a hydride, we'd get stuck at the at the alcohol. You can't reduce an alcohol by just using hydrides. But instead, if you take that carbonyl and you convert it to a hydrozone, then all you have to do is expose it to hydroxide, water, and heat. And you wind up making nitrogen gas and replacing that those nitrogen bonds with um, hydrogens. So they call this the the Wolf Kishner reaction. Um, so this the only this get, winds up giving us a much better yield. The only the other way we could potentially take this. Um, carbonyl and turn it all the way to carbon hydrogen bonds um, would be to turn it to an alcohol, make the alcohol a good leaving group, go through an elimination reaction, and then we could hydrogenate it. In theory, we could get here, but it would take a lot more steps to do that, right? So our overall yield being fairly high tells us this is a much more efficient route um to to turn this carbonyl into carbon hydrogen bonds um and we wind up see especially for reactions that wind up being relevant for industrial processes um a difference of even a couple percent in terms of efficiency can mean big money for a lot of these um pharmaceutical companies because when you're talking about say making something you know, let's, if you're talking about making Tylenol, 
um, and you make a billion dollars a year selling Tylenol, well, all of a sudden, getting 1% more efficient, getting 1% more profit, that winds 1% of a billion dollars is $10 million. So that starts being like pretty small changes in, in synthesis efficiency wind up being really big. Um, so the, the more we can um, limit the number of steps and increase our efficiency, the better for synthesis problems. All right, so here's the first real new reaction. And it's not really a new reaction, it's just undoing the previous reaction. Um, if we make acetals, imines, enamines, oxymes, hydrozones, all of those reactions are re reversible the whole way through the process, which means if we just reverse the conditions and expose those compounds to water in an acidic environment, we wind up undoing what we just made, right? And so those are referred to as hydrolysis reactions. Um, and if you've taken taken bio by this point, you've probably heard of hydrolysis reactions at some point. Hydrolysis literally means water splitting. Um, and so hydrolysis means you're adding water and you're splitting things up. So in bio terms, we see that a lot for um, hydrolysis of proteins. If you expose proteins to the right, um, to enough acid or base with some water, you end up splitting the proteins into the individual amino acids. Um, so those are a good, that's a good example of a hydrolysis reaction. In this case, we're just breaking the bonds we just made and turning it back to a carbonyl. All right, so let's do some practice and give you guys five minutes to work on these and we'll go through them. All right, so we'll start with A. 
So for anything that's not a carbonyl that's going to go through these processes, we're going to be looking to break the new bonds that formed and turn it back to a carbonyl. So for ethers, you expose ethers to, to an acid, you break the ether up and turn it to um, an alcohol to start. And if it's a, an acetal, if it's diether, on the same carbon, we wind up breaking both of those and turning it back to being first a hemi hemiacetal, where you have the ether and the alcohol attached to the same carbon. And then you kick the ether off to turn it back to a carbonyl. So we would wind up making the diol as one product and cyclopentanone. No. Let's get mole view up. No sense in me making really messy figures when these ones are pretty easy to draw. All right, so for our bottom one, we've got nitrogen, a primary nitrogen, which means we're going to take that that carbonyl, and we're going to convert it to a carbon nitrogen pi bond. Even if you don't remember what the name of this functional group is, we still can look at this nitrogen and say, okay, that nitrogens try to make a carbon nitrogen double bond. They try to replace that carbonyl oxygen with a nitrogen. So we're going to wind up making. The hydrozone. That's our first step for this reaction. Is in step one, if you have acid and nitrogen and it tells you you're losing a water molecule, we're forming the hydrozone. And then remember, if you take one of these hydrozones, these in particular were important because they can be fully reduced with really easy reagents with just hydroxide and water. So that's going to further take the same molecule, and now we're going to reduce it, and we're going to replace those nitrogens with carbon-hydrogen bonds. For B, if we're starting with a carbon nitrogen double bond and we're exposing it to acid, we're going to be taking that carbon nitrogen double bond and we're going to break the nitrogen off and replace it with a, an oxygen. We're going to remake the carbonyl. So in this case, we're going to be using oxygen as a nucleophile to undo the uh, nucleophilic addition that we had happened before. So count your molecules, one, two, three, four. We're replacing that nitrogen with a carbonyl. And then we still have another atom around. We wind up with. Um, methyl amine as our side product here. All right, that's just the part of the, that's the nitrogen um, being broken off and turning back into being a primary amine. D. We don't have a carbon nitrogen double bond because we have a secondary amine here. So it couldn't make the imine. So it made the enamine instead. 
And so if we undo this reaction, it's going to go through, going to basically do the same thing. We're going to chop off the nitrogen, including its two methyl groups. So we'll get dimethylamine. And then the rest of this molecule winds up. So we wind up with a bridge, but carbon between the two sides, and then turning one of these carbons over here into a carbonyl. All right, so this is where the double bond was, the bond that's highlighted green right here. And where the oxygen is, is where the nitrogen was attached when it was the enamine. And this feels like something that should have a common name. This seems like something that might be common enough to have a common name. Oh, there's another. Nor camphor. So camphor um, is a molecule that's fairly common. Camphor gets used as it's a uh, terpene, um, and it's used pretty commonly uh, in in a lot of different places as a as an odorant, as something that smells good. Um, nor camphor is the simplified version. You see, it's got the bicyclic structure with the with the ketone. Camphor is going to have extra methyl groups on it, but it's very close to being the same molecule. Uh, and there is, that's right, camphor is um, uh, Vicks vapor rub is mostly camphor. Um, it's used as a, a decongestant. All right. So questions on these reactions? Everything makes sense, or at least when I did it. Um, if we have sulfur acting as a nucleophile, we basically are going to have a very, very similar reactions. When we had oxygen acting as a, uh, a nucleophile, we turned um, our carbonyls into hemiacetals and acetals. Um, so if you expose a carbonyl to a thiol instead of an alcohol, you make a thioacetal. Remember, thio is just that prefix that means sulfur instead of oxygen. And just like with the oxygens, you can do the same thing where you convert um, to a cyclic thioacetal, which is useful for as a protecting group. Except here's another good case where, where this is a way we can um, fully reduce our molecule. So this winds up being another way we can take a carbonyl and convert it all the way to being carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, so and it winds up being a pretty, pretty easy reaction. Once you make the thioacetal, you just have to expose it to rainy nickel, which is a catalyst. Um, as you might guess, it's got nickel involved. It's mostly nickel with a few other metals mixed in, um, and that that gives it a good surface to react on. So if you expose it to rainy nickel, you're going to replace those sulfurs with hydrogens. So, you know, we now have, um, we now have several options. We have two options to go from a carbonyl to fully reduced. Um, and the exact 
method we were we would pick would depend on our application, depending on what we were trying to use it for, what chemicals we had in the stock room, um, what else, what are these R groups exactly? We might choose this reduction as opposed to the hydrozone reduction, the um, the Wolf Kishner reduction versus the thioacetal reduction. Um, we would depending if we we're trying to take a process a synthesis and turn it into a um, industrial process, we we're trying to make money with it. We would test both of these reactions because they're, it's the same number of steps, right? You take the carbonyl, convert it to something else, and then expose it to um, a hydrogen source and you wind up getting your fully reduced process. Um, so, and also depending on how cheap your reactants are and how much you can reuse your reactants. Um, so it, it, it really would be on a case by case basis, um, which of these reactions we would want to use. <clears throat> All right, so here's, here's a summary slide. And these are the three main methods we have at this point of reducing carbonyls to an alkane. Um, back when we were first looking at aromatics, we had this reaction called the Clemenson reaction. We didn't go over its name. Um, but if you have a benzylic carbon, you can, you can convert that benzylic carbonyl um, to an alkane if you expose it to this zinc mercury alloy with HCl and heat, and you get a decent yield. If it's not a benzylic carbonyl, though, we can't use that method. That only works if it's a benzylic carbonyl. So that one's a really, really favorable reaction because everything's cheap. Everything involved is cheap. It's got a pretty good yield, but it's limited in what we can use it for. Um, the Wolf-Kishner reaction, we wind up with getting also getting a good yield. Um, and our R groups that are attached to the carbonyl wind up being pretty stable. Uh, we wind up with this reaction being able to happen under basic conditions. So if we have R groups that are stable in bases, mean, meaning that there's not a good target, another good target for a nucleophile, because remember these bases are also going to be good nucleophiles. Um, then this is a good option to use, this Wolf-Kishner reaction. If we have this other process is called desulfurization and doesn't have the same yield, um, but we're doing this under acidic conditions. And acidic conditions are usually less dangerous to your other functional groups that might be around. So if we if we need something, if we have a, a functional group that will react with a base that will, that is, you know, maybe is a um, uh, halo alkane, maybe there's a chloride attached somewhere over here and we'd want that chloride to stay on there. Well, we can't expose it to base because that base, that hydroxide is going to attack and act as a nucleophile and you'll get a, an SN2 reaction happening. However, if we do it under acidic conditions, we don't wind up with that other functional group reacting. All right, so this winds up being sort of a one of the finer points of synthesis is if you have multiple functional groups, picking the right route winds up being very important. All three of these will get you to the same point, but depending on what else you have around, you need to be careful which route you take. When I'm driving, when I'm driving home from Rayleigh's with a carload full of groceries, if I didn't pack them very well in the back and I can hear bottles rolling around, I take the route to my house that involves less windy roads. But if I'm not worried about bottles rolling around in the back or if it's packed well, then I can take the faster route that gives me the better yield, for instance. Right. So depending on what your exact conditions are, it's going to change the route you take for synthesis. All right, let me double check the slides real quick. 
we are about halfway through. We'll do one more slide and then we'll take a break and come back. Um, because as I mentioned before, hydrides are really simple reactants in a lot of ways. Hydrides can are act, gonna act as a nucle, nucle, excuse me, nucleophile. Um, but our hydrides can't get very complicated. There's no pi bonds forming between carbon and hydrogen, right? So there's no tricky new functional groups forming when we expose a carbonyl to a hydride source. Um, they're always gonna work the same way. You've got a nucleophilic attack, and then you have to have a proton transfer. These ones can't, you can't go for, for our other oxygen nucleophiles, you could go under acidic conditions or basic conditions, right? Our nucleophilic addition could happen through two, both mechanisms. And if it went through an acidic mechanism, then that just meant you had an extra proton transfer at the beginning. Um, you can't do that with hydride sources though. Hydride sources will react with acids to make hydrogen gas really, really quickly and efficiently. So hydride sources have to be under basic conditions. Um, but that also simplifies things because it means we only have one mechanism to worry about. If you have a hydride, your hydride acts to attack the carbonyl carbon and break the carbon oxygen pi bond. And then step two for both of these is your proton source donates a proton. If you're using sodium borohydride, it's a mild enough reactant that it actually won't react with the methanol. Um, so you can actually have those both present at the same time. But if you have lithium aluminum hydride, it's too, too good at reacting. So you have to have lithium aluminum hydride make this intermediate first and then add water. But in both cases, the water and the methanol are gonna serve the, the same purpose. They're, a hydride so all right sorry a uh, proton source in both cases all right so and and we've seen both of these reactions before right when we talked in the alcohol chapter last quarter we talked about making alcohols using these techniques now this since this is the carbonyl and ketone chapter we're specifically talking about it from the point of view of the carbonyl but it's the same reaction. Any questions about hydrides? Any lingering concerns that you've had since last quarter thinking about hydrides? All right, then we're going at a pretty good clip today. Um, so we can actually take a 15 minute break. Let's come back at nine and we will start talking about carbon nucleophiles.
All right, let's start coming back here. And just just for fun, I can't find the original video right now, but that uh, that guy who pours melty things in into um, other things, the guy who poured uh, mol melted salt into a fish tank, you guys remember that video and blew up the fish tank? Um, he also has a pretty cool video that I can only find a gif of right now of him dropping dry ice into non-Newtonian fluid. Um, which if you were if you were a kid in the 2000s, um, you may have heard it called oobleck. I don't particularly it's just cornstarch and water. If you mix cornstarch and water in the right um, in the right ratio, you get a non-Newtonian fluid. And a non-Newtonian fluid means it resists force more if you're pushing if you push fast. So which is why it bounces at first and then sinks in. Um, and so, and then it just kind of looks cool. This goes along, he calls himself the backyard scientist. He's more like the backyard um, guy with the high speed camera who just wants to try random crap because he doesn't actually do any science, but he does make some cool videos. Um, in particular, the other, the other really interesting one is he, he melted aluminum and he, and he drilled a hole in a watermelon and then he poured melted aluminum into the hole in the watermelon. And it made this a really cool, like fractally looking piece of aluminum. Um, so if you're looking for random stuff that you can zone out to, that's kind of still sciencey, his channel is actually very entertaining that way. Um, doesn't require a whole lot of attention or uh, thought. Anyway, and although, you know, what's even better for that, if uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has live streams of some of their most popular exhibits, so you can just put on the jellyfish and just watch the jellyfish at the Monterey Bay Aquarium while you're while you're studying, um, stream it to your your TV um, or the otters for that matter. All right, so let's talk a little bit about carbon based nucleophiles. Um, carbon based nucleophiles are um, the basic the most, uh, the first carbon-based nucleophile that we ever looked at was Grignard reagents. And so Grignard reagents, remember, was when we took, if we take a um, bromoalkane and expose it to magnesium, we wound up making a Grignard reagent where we had that, a carbon-magnesium bond. And carbon attached to a metal is always going to be more electrophilic, or sorry, electronegative than the metal. So we wind up with a partial negative charge on the carbon, which means that our carbon can then act as a nucleophile. Um, so in this case, the Grignard reagents are, they react the exact same way as, as hydrides. They're typically saturated. They're typically fairly simple molecules, but they're a pretty good way to add a couple carbons or one carbon. Um, to a carbonyl, and that reduces it and turns it to the alcohol. Um, so the, the mechanism would just look like, got to, our nucleophile attacks the carbonyl carbon, and then we would wind up with an intermediate that looked like, oxygen with a negative charge and our R group that we're attaching. And then step two is expose it to a proton source and you do a proton transfer. All right, so again, same mechanism, same two steps. And just like with hydride sources, this can't happen in an acidic environment. So the order is not even gonna change these. It always has to be your carbon-based nucleophile comes in first and then attaches, and then you can protonate the oxygen after the Grignard reagents all been used up. Um, and we do see that if it's if we wind up making a new stereocenter, we wind up with the racemic mixture, the um, mixture of both enantiomers. So again, we've seen this one before just reviewing it, getting us really comfortable with it. 
however, the problem with Grignard reagents is that Grignard reagents are really hard to work with. They, these Grignard reagents are not that easy to make on their own. That's the, it's simple enough looking reaction to make a Grignard reagent, but they're very unstable. They'll react with moisture in the air. Um, if there's any moisture at all present when you try to do this reaction, you're going to wind up with your Grignard reagent reacting with the water instead of reacting with the carbonyl. Um, and so, and to the point where if you actually did this reaction in a lab, um, basically you wind up with at least a six hour lab because you have to make your Grignard reagent and use it the same day. You can't store it um, because just the inherent moisture in the air um, makes it almost impossible to keep these things stored because you also can't store them at high temperatures because they'll react with the oxygen then. So they're really, really hard to work with um, even though their mechanism is really nice and simple and they give good yields, they're much more common to use in, in research labs because you might be doing an eight hour lab one day um, because that's literally your job as a research, as a uh, grad student or as a researcher is to be spending all day in lab. Um, they're really hard to do in an educational lab where we're limited to only three hours at a time. Um, and then once you make your Grignard reagent, you then have to to add it to your glassware setup, and your glassware setup has to have been, um, has to be anhydrous as well. You basically have to bake your glassware to drive off all, all um, moisture, and then assemble your glassware apparatus while it's still hot, so that it still is going to, and then seal it so that no moisture is in there because it, it was all really hot when you put it together. So. Again, simple reaction, really hard to use in the real world. Um, if we want to use a different mechanism rather than a Grignard reagent, an, a really stable, if, if dangerous, reactant is uh, cyanide. Cyanide is a really good carbon-based nucleophile. It's another way to add a carbon um, to this system. Um, the problem is cyanide is, you know, highly toxic and will kill you um, very quickly. You know, carbon monoxide is toxic. Cyanide has the same mechanism as carbon monoxide. They both work the same way. They both bond um, to your hemoglobin, the, the iron in your hemoglobin, more strongly than oxygen does. So in both cases, carbon monoxide and cyanide have the same mechanism of, of killing you, basically. Um, the thing is, is that carbon monoxide bonds to um, bonds to your iron about, I want to say it's 80 times better than oxygen does. Um, and cyanide bonds about 2000 times better than oxygen does. So it's, it takes a very, very small amount of cyanide to kill you because you essentially just suffocate. It basically coats your hemoglobin very, very quickly. And your hemoglobin, your heart's still pumping, your lungs are still breathing in oxygen but your hemoglobin can't carry the oxygen to your brain and to your muscles. Um, so has, this has its own set of, of um, restrictions and challenges to work with this, but it actually winds up giving you better yields in a lot of cases because you don't have to fight with the moisture so much. Um, and we wind up, and it reacts in a very, very, simple way as well cyanide if you if you draw the lewis dot structure for cyanide it's a carbon triple bonded to an oxygen and you wind up with an a lone pair on either side and the lone pair on the carbon side that gives the carbon a negative charge so that's a really kind of easy way to see how that nucleophile is going to work. The negative charge on the carbon comes in here and attaches right there. You make room for it. And then you just, and this is being done in acidic conditions. So probably before that happens, you do a proton transfer to protonate that carbonyl. Um, and this, this gives you a class of, of molecules called a cyanohydrin. A, and a cyanohydrin is just a carbon nitrogen 
group, a cyanide group attached to the same carbon as a oxygen. So same, same language and terminology as remember the halo hydrins where we could add a, um, an OH to the same carbon as a chlorine. And we call those a halo hydrin. Um, this is a cyanohydrin. Hydrin means you also have a hydroxide attached in most cases. Uh, and these are, again, a lot of these reactions we're looking at so far wind up being useful synthesis wise because we can then turn them into something else, something more common. Um, in particular, a cyanohydrin can then be either reduced if you expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, you wind up taking that cyanide group and you just add a whole bunch of hydrides to it. And you turn it into from being a carbon nitrogen triple bond to being an amine. Or if you go the other route, you just expose it to acid and heat, you wind up breaking that nitrogen off and turning it into a carboxylic acid. Um, and so this is actually a, this is another way that you can um, add a single carbon here. And then this, now that we have a carboxylic acid here, we have a couple re reactions that we're used to dealing with, where we could take the carboxylic acid and expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, and we'd wind up getting another alcohol. So we could get a diol this way and put the OHs on adjacent carbons, for instance. And I want to, in the interest of giving, giving you some context for the other place we see these, I want to say that um, if it's not a cyanohyde, Hydrin, if you just have a cyanide group attached. Um, it's a nitrile. And so nitriles, you've seen those. Um, you've seen that term likely if you, um, especially in this past year, right? Nitrile gloves are really commonly used in hospitals and doctors' offices. Um, they're not used all that often in chemis chemistry labs because nitriles react um, with other functional groups and they dissolve pretty well in solvents. So they're useful for in biological conditions, where you worry about biological contaminants, but they're not very useful in chemistry in a lot of ways um, because you wind up with all of these other reactions that can happen, hydrolysis, reduction, alkylation, nucleophiles, miscellaneous methods. Um, all of those reactions are things you don't want gloves to do while you're dealing with chemicals, right? Generally, you want your gloves to stay gloves and not to turn into some other functional group. Um, and that also applies, you, you want to be careful using, um, getting the right kind of gloves. If you do any work with woodworking or finishing um, where you're dealing with, um, with any solvents, you gotta make sure you get the right gloves, um, which sometimes means getting gloves that are not as comfortable to wear. Those vinyl ones are actually really good for a lot of solvents, but they're the ones that um, you think of, um, I like, they make me think of um, the gloves lunch ladies would wear when you were in, in grade school, like the really floppy, really, really thin plastic. Those are actually really good for a lot of finishes in chemistry um, because they don't dissolve that, those vinyls um, won't dissolve easily in solvents. You laugh, but everybody knew exactly what kind of gloves I was talking about, right? All right, so let's practice with some of these reactions. If we have a thiol reacting with a carbonyl, here's our nucleophile. I'll give you guys a head start on these, but remember, just look for the nucleophile and try and, and figure out what's either what's going to happen, either work through the mechanism or go back and check your notes. And then we'll go through these in, uh, in a few minutes.
All right, let me grab Moldview and we will start working through these. All right, so for this first one, our sulfur is a nucleophile. It's going to attach here, and we're going to do both of them. We're going to lose an H2O. So it's a, a um, dehydration reaction. We do the, the nucleophilic addition first, then the nucleophilic substitution. So our overall reaction, so it's going to start to, by making Let's see. So, and again, to try and make sure we don't lose a carbon here, um, I would I would recommend you know drawing everything out. The intermediate actually winds up being really helpful in this case, um, as far as making sure you don't lose a carbon. Right. So, attach one of the sulfurs, and then it was three carbons, and then the other sulfur. There's our three carbons, one, two, three. There's our other sulfur. So I drew it in kind of a weird way, um, just so I could wind up putting the other sulfur kind of close to the, the what was the carbonyl carbon. So our last step here would look like that. Oxygen leaves our other sulfur bonds. And you can see that that's going to give you a six-sided ring. We have the carbonyl, um, the carbonyl carbon, one sulfur, then three carbons, then the other sulfur. So that's a total of six atoms. So we get a six-sided ring where two of them are sulfur and the carbon in between the two sulfurs has two methyls attached to it. So you could draw it. Like this. The other way to, to do it, to draw it would be to draw it, draw the carbons from the carbonyl from the acetone just the way they were. And then just add your, once you know it's a six-sided ring that you're adding, put it, attach it that way. So that might might make more sense um, spatially. Although. Apparently, it's hard to draw those um, six-sided rings properly and not make it look like a squished hexagon uh, on mole view. If we start by making the thioacetal and then follow it up with the rainy nickel, that rainy nickel was one of our three ways of hydrogenating right, of fully reducing the carbon. So we'd wind up for the second one, we'd wind up with an intermediate that looked like this. And it's not asking for the intermediate specifically, but for the sake of practicing, it's a five-sided ring now, right? Because we only have two carbons in between the two sulfurs. And then we're going to take that and we're going to replace that whole thing with hydrogens. So our final product would just look like this. Or if you wanted to draw the hydrogens in for the sake of, of showing what changed, you could add the, add them in, even if we're drawing skeletal structures. It's not it's not uh, usually considered wrong to show hydrogens if if those are the new bonds that we added. Um, occasionally, it can still be worth it, and nobody's gonna nobody's gonna think twice at you drawing those hydrogens in because you're specifically drawing attention to what changed over the course of the reaction. Now, if it wasn't in the context of the reaction, if you were just 
if you just drew a structure and you showed two of the hydrogens, but not the rest of the hydrogens, um, people are going to look at you funny, but everybody will still know what you meant. Down here, we have a Grignard reagent. We've got a uh, magnesium involved. So we've got phenyl magnesium bromide. So me that means we've got our a benzene that's going to be added as a nucleophile to the carbonyl carbon. So our first intermediate, actually, it's um, only one reaction here. So, but we're going to wind up seeing our carbonyl gets turned into an OH. And then the aldehyde carbon, we wind up attaching a benzene to it. Right, and that aldehyde hydrogen is still there. So, and again, so since since we drew the hydrogen for the aldehyde on the reactant, um, it wouldn't be wrong to show it this way. Um, and actually, you wind up seeing some molecules that look very similar to this actually wind up being pretty useful, especially if you put a nitrogen in the middle. Um, a lot of um, antihistamines and sleep aids wind up looking something similar to this. Um, I'm pretty sure Benadryl is, uh, is diphenhydramine is the official name. Although I mixed that up. So we'll look at that in a second. Um, so if being able to put two benzene rings attached to the same thing actually winds up being useful in, uh, in pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, if we have cyclo, cyclohexyl carbonaldehyde, whatever the, yeah, carbonaldehyde, that's how we named it. When there was a aldehyde directly attached to a benzene ring, we named it as though it was, um, we said cyclohexane carbonaldehyde was our name for those, right? Because they had to have their own specific name because there's not a good way to name a single carbon chain aldehyde. Um, it's going to, if it's reacting with a hydride source, we're just going to reduce that carbon, not fully reduce it to all hydrogens. We're going to turn it to a primary alcohol. So our product. would just look like this. And we added a hydrogen here. This next one is a multi-step. So let's look at it. And we'll look at it in the context of of um, the drawing the intermediates. So our first intermediate is going to be, even if you don't remember what this type of functional group is called, remember that cyanide is a good nucleophile. So the fact we have these CN groups, we're going to add a CN as a nucleophile to the carbon here. Um, so we'll wind up turning this carbonyl into an OH group. And then we add the carbon there. So our intermediate is going to look like that. Then it was the case of remembering, OK, well, now we've got a hydride source. The hydride source can't reduce the, the carbonyl carbon any further, but it can reduce the carbon-nitrogen triple bond. So we're going to replace those carbon nitrogen pi bonds with hydrogens. And then that's what the third step is as well as just being the proton source. So our final product here is going to wind up looking like, and I always draw these too close together. <laughs> 
We don't do anything to the OH group for the second and third steps. We don't do anything to the primary, the uh, molecule we started with. We just take the, what was the nitrile group and we convert it to its fully reduced state. All right, so we added a carbon and a nitrogen, then fully reduced everything as far as we could. And again, I'm only drawing these hydrogens for the sake of showing them. Um, and what's more, a more common way to draw this, to write this, would instead of drawing out this oxygen hydrogen bond, would just be to put OH and just write NH2 here. Um, but Moldview doesn't let me do that. So for the sake of showing those hydrogens for, on those functional groups, I have them drawn as bonds, but writing it as just NH2 is acceptable too. In fact, more common. Last but not least, we've got cyanide as a nucleophile again. So our intermediate, one, two, three, four, turn that into the hydrogen. And then we add, all right, so we're, We've got cyanide being added again. So the first step is we're turning that carbonyl into an OH group and then adding a carbon nitrogen triple bond. And then this was the other possible reaction for those nitriles. The nitriles, if you just expose them to acid and heat, you turn them all the way to a carboxylic acid. We basically are going to, it's, it's a lot like ozonolysis. We're going to chop this triple bond up and turn it to a carboxylic acid. So you lose the nitrogen and turn it into the carboxylic acid. And if there's one functionality I really wish Moldview had, it, was, it would be that bothers me that you can't copy and paste things. But I'm picky. So our OH is still going to stay there. We broke off the um, and this was a hydrogen. Because it's an aldehyde we're dealing with. Um, we're going to break off the nitrogen and turn it to the carboxylic acid. So our final product would look like this. And again, on a, on a test, don't be afraid to draw the intermediate, even if you're not sure what the second step does, show me the intermediate. And if you can get the intermediate right, I can give you more partial credit um, than if you just show me a mangled final product that's not the right final product and I don't know what you did. If you can show me you at least got the first step right, that's always better than nothing, right? And plus, it's going to help you get the next step right because you can look at it and say, okay, well, I don't remember what my two mechanisms were or my two reactions were for nitriles, but I know that I've got a I'm got a hydride source, so I'm probably going to reduce it. What would this look like if I just added a bunch of hydrides to it, and just take a guess? Or um, I'm just exposing it to a bunch of of acid and heat. What might that do? And at least give it, it gives you something to work from when it comes to trying to figure these out. That said, your tests are all going to be open book at this point, right? So. Um, you can always go back and look up your reaction summaries, go back to this chapter 
find the reaction summary and say, okay, the halo or the cyanohydrins, those were my two reactions, reduction or oxidation. Any questions on these reactions? How'd they go? Are we going too fast, just right? All right. It, the way that I see this chapter is it's a whole bunch of reactions to learn, but none of them are inherently that difficult. So it just takes practice, which is why we practice. And I keep reiterating over and over. So I believe that this is the last reaction for this chapter, or one of the last reactions for this chapter. Um, and it's, it's a sort of its own animal. It's one of those reactions that has its own mechanism, but its mechanism is a little bit different than what we've been looking at. Um, and it's called the, the Wittig reagent. I believe that that's a W that's pronounced as a V. I don't know if the guy was, was Russian, but if I'm remembering correctly, I think it's Wittig, um, German. All right. Um, I always mix those, those languages up, despite the fact they're nothing like each other. Um, so if we're trying to, if we're going to reduce this, but not just turn it into carbon hydrogen bonds, um, the, the Wittig reaction is a way that we can basically replace the oxygen with a carbon. So it's almost like the, the anti-ozonolysis. Ozonolysis took a carbon-carbon pi bond and turned it into a carbonyl, right? This undoes that. This takes a carbonyl and turns it to a, an alkene. All right, so we wind up, um, our net reaction is just, we wind up with this Wittig reaction or reagent where you have a carbon double bound to a phosphorus and it's, it's a triphenyl phosphorus. It has, it's a very specific reagent. Uh, so it's always gonna be an R group double bound to a phosphorus. And if you expose that Wittig reagent to a carbonyl, that carbon that's double bound to the phosphorus actually is, can act as a nucleophile um, and so you wind up with this, sorry, yeah, nucleophile. So the general process is that we wind up with something kind of similar to what we've seen before, um, except that instead of just breaking this pi bond um, to, to make a negative charge on that oxygen, the carbon actually is still bound, our, our carbon nucleophile is still attached to the phosphorus at this point. And the phosphorus has a positive charge. So the negative charge on the oxygen doesn't just stay as a negative charge, we actually wind up with this weird four-sided ring intermediate, where your, your two carbons are attached together and then your oxygen actually bonds to your phosphorus. Right, and so this is what's called, a, this is a two plus two cycloaddition. It's a cycloaddition kind of like a Diels-Alder in, in some ways that we have sort of all of these electrons moving in a ring. Um, but this intermediate right here in the middle is the one I was talking about. You wind up with our, our carbon that was the nucleophile is attached to the other carbon, our carbonyl carbon, and they get kind of hard to um, keep track of which carbon is which at this point, if you're not careful. Um, and then your oxygen gets attached to the phosphorus. And oxygen phosphorus bonds are generally even more stable than oxygen carbon bonds. And so you wind up with that, that same mo electron movement happening again. The remaining carbon phosphorus bond moves over to the what was the carbonyl oxygen, and the oxygen takes its electrons with it and goes off with the phosphorus to make this triphenyl phosphorus oxide. Right, so the, the two steps, these are two different names of these types of mechanism steps. Um, it's essentially the two plus two cycloaddition is really like two nucleophilic attacks at the same time. 
you wind up with the nucleophilic attack of your carbon nucleophile on your vitig reagent attacking the carbonyl carbon and your electrons from your carbonyl bond attack the phosphorus at the same time. And then this other, this other step is not one that we've talked about in detail, um, but a lot of times in, chem in OCHEM, we will wind up making an unstable intermediate. And the next step is basically things fall apart. Um, so we just call that a fragmentation step where basically you, we made this unstable intermediate and then it just breaks apart. Um, and we can draw the arrows for it, but it's, it's kind of similar to two leaving groups leave at the same time in this case, right? You've got your oxygen leaving group leaves to go with the phosphorus and you've got your carbon leaving group leaves the phosphorus to go to the other carbon. All right, so just even though we have two different names for these types of steps, the individual steps kind of still make sense following our rules that we've been doing all the way since what, October probably, we first brought in mechanisms. Um, so this is the process of making a Wittig reagent. And basically you can do this with pretty much any, any alkyl halide. Um, that also, uh, you need to have at least one hydrogen attached. So you can't do this with a tertiary alkyl halide, but a secondary alkyl halide or a primary alkyl halide, um, you need a hydrogen on it for the second step to happen. You basically, you need to be able to remove a hydrogen. And it kind of makes sense according to what we're going to make at the end, right? Because we're going to make something um, with a carbon pi bond we need to have something that can be pulled off of this carbon. You can't have three R groups on your alkyl halide because then there's not, there's not really a good leaving group for this second step, right? You need a, um, we're gonna expose it to a strong base that's gonna pull off a hydrogen. So you need a, a hydrogen to be there. But that's really the, the main limitation here. These other two, groups that aren't being pulled off by the base can be any R group you want. Any alkyl halide um, can be used here. And so that gives us a wide range for what we could have as our, instead of having two hydrogens here, you could have two methyls, you could have a methyl and a hydrogen. Um, you could have an isopropyl group attached. We, we kind of have a really broad range of um, reactions that we can or uh, molecules we can create with this process. And the interesting thing about this is it actually gives us very, very good stereoselectivity. Meaning when we make this new carbon-carbon pi bond, we only get one, not only, we, we predominantly get um, one product, one major product. We don't get the E and the Z mixed together. We are going to get the Z product based on the sterics for the most part, although it gets a little complicated. Um, if we have just an alkyl group here, when we, when we go through this reaction, um, we're going to wind up making the product that puts the two big carbon groups pointed the same direction. Um, but if we actually have an electron withdrawing group attached, then we wind up making just the E or predominantly the E in antiomer. So something funny has to be happening with these reactions. It's, it has, can't be just sterics because just sterics would say that doesn't matter whether it's electron donating or electron withdrawing, you should just get the Z or just get the E. But the fact that we can put an electron withdrawing group and that changes which product we get tells us something weird is happening. It means it's something that has to do with either with resonance or electron um, electronegativity or something is happening in the course of this reaction. And it's not, it's known more or less how that happens. We'll go over why that is on 
Tuesday. Um, but for now, we're just going to treat it. Um, we're just going to go through this as a way of predicting which of these products we get. If our Wittig, or Wittig reagent has an electron donating group, we get the Z. We get everything on the same side. If it's electron withdrawing, we get them pointed in opposite directions. So let's try this. Both cases, the Wittig reagent has been made already. And for A, we're not going to get an E or a Z, right? For A, we have two ethyls on either side of the carbonyl, which means when we make our final product, there is no E or Z. We're just going to replace that carbonyl with the carbon that's bound to the phosphorus. which then had an ethyl group attached. In B, the Wittig reagent looks a little different, but it's still we still got a carbon double bound to a phosphorus, or sorry, a carbon bound to a phosphorus, and that carbon's going to act as a nucleophile. So that's the carbon that's going to get attached where the carbonyl oxygen was, and it's an electron withdrawing reagent. This group over here is electron withdrawing, which means we get the E enantiomer, or sorry, stereoisomer, where we wind up with things on opposite sides. So keeping it drawn the way they have it shown here, there's the new carbon we added, and then it was a carbonyl O E T. Right, the big thing here is recognizing um, that we are, or what the carbon is that's going to wind up in the place of the carbonyl. So it's, this is our carbon that's going to get added in place of the oxygen. It's whatever is directly attached to the phosphorus gets added where the oxygen is, and you make a, turn it into an alkene. Mixing, mixing up in the E and the Z is not that big of a deal. Um, although if you've got your notes in front of you, you should be able to remember electron withdrawing versus electron donating and pay attention to that. Um, and the rest of this, this rest of this phosphorus, that's just another version of the Wittig reagent. Instead of having triphenyl phosphorus, you can have this um, diethoxy phosphorus that, that uh, reacts the same way. It just looks a little different. Anytime you see a carbon phosphorus bond, you should be thinking of Wittig reaction. All right, because we haven't dealt with phosphorus at all yet, really, right? So this is our only, that's a dead giveaway. The only reaction we know at this point with phosphorus is the Wittig reagent. Questions on these ones? All right, so just to recap, we added a whole bunch of nucleophiles. We looked at all of these reactions. And with the exception of the Wittig reaction, they all had the same mechanism. These are all just nucleophiles. And even the Wittig reaction wasn't that different. We just had to move two bonds at the same time. 
and you end up making a pi bond instead of the rest of these, which were just pure addition reactions. There might be something with it a little bit different flavors as far as then the nitrogen can rearrange or then your oxygen can leave and you make an acetal. But all of the individual, the first step for each of these was break the carbon oxygen pi bond and attach your nucleophile to the carbonyl oxygen, or sorry, carbonyl carbon. And then they changed a little bit from there, depending on what the conditions were and what the nucleophile was. But the first step for each of them was the same. So I, we added a lot of material, but at the same time, if you if we understand the mechanism, it actually it's most of them should make sense, even if you have to check your notes for as far as which one turns into an enamine or. Um, how you know what happens if you have a, a cyano group get exposed to something else afterwards, right? All right, excellent work this week. Watch for the quiz. Um, I have office hours at ten thirty. If anybody um, wants to troubleshoot any of the lab stuff or go over some some reactions, um, and other than that. Everybody have yourselves a good weekend.